I must say thank you to Congresswoman Lawrence uh, for partnering with me here on this event today, this afternoon. Greetings to everybody. I hope you're well. I had plans to visit Detroit earlier this spring. However, things were postponed for safety purposes as the coronavirus spread uh, aggressively throughout the country. And I am truly grateful to be here healthy and safe during these uncertain and unprecedented times. I hope you are as well. Uh, the panelists joining us here uh, are all well, and I hope you are there that are watching online. I'm grateful uh, that we're all able to address you on this pressing issue of the internet inequality during this COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic has truly exposed the glaring inequities that we have in our society, and internet inequality is at the top of that list. We have heard countless heartbreaking stories about the obstacles families have to go through when they lack broadband access at home. Parents and children are uncomfortably piled into their family cars in order to access a public Wi-Fi so that their children can participate in distance learning. And unfortunately, overcoming these seemingly insurmountable obstacles to get access to broadband is the harsh reality for millions of low-income families across this nation. In Detroit, a city that is historically known for innovation and opportunity, an astonishing, staggering 60% of the city's public students lack access to broadband. And Congresswoman Lawrence continues to raise concerns about this pointed issue. It is clear that our longstanding digital divide has morphed into a monstrous new COVID-19 divide for these young learners. And that's why I have advocated passionately for a connectivity stimulus that includes a call for the Federal Communications Commission to rapidly increase the stock of lendable brief hotspots available through the FCC's school and public libraries program known as E-Rate. But additionally, as part of that connectivity stimulus, the commission must work to expand and strengthen the Lifeline program, a critical aspect of our social safety net and the only the only federal program with the sole mission of bringing affordable communications to low-income households. There are approximately 38 million households, these are old numbers, that are eligible for Lifeline. It is only uh, currently subscribed by about 7 million um, uh, households, so that's around 19 to 20 percent. In Michigan, we know that over 1 million laid off workers are receiving unemployment assistance just in the last six weeks. Michiganders are raising their hands for help and the need for connectivity is clear. That's why I have repeatedly called on the commission to coordinate with federal agencies that administer the services that determine eligibility for Lifeline in order to better inform these low income consumers about the program. I was deeply pleased to see that 144 members of Congress, uh, including Congresswoman Lawrence, agreed with me and wrote a letter to the chairman advocating for further cooperation between the FCC, USDA, and HHS with the goal of increasing subscribership in the Lifeline program. It was the strongest bicameral letter, both Senate and House, that I have seen in quite some time. It just makes plain common sense. Americans cannot afford for our government to work in silos. Additionally, it is important that we expand the Lifeline program similar to what was done in Hurricane uh, Katrina aftermath to meet today's communication needs of these low income consumers. I've heard directly from Lifeline subscribers and advocates who have sounded the alarm to let the FCC know that the program's minimum service standards of 1000 minutes and three gigs of data a month are simply not enough when a majority of Americans have been ordered to shelter in place. And while I've seen providers step up and address the concerns of our most vulnerable through an increase in voice and data offerings, we also need the commission to step up. As Joshua Edmonds, director of the digital inclusion for the city of Detroit and is here today, has said during his recent testimony before Congress, we don't want to exhaust company generosity or simply be dependent on their charity. I quite agree. So today we're here to discuss, to discuss connectivity solutions both for the state of Michigan and even broader for all Americans, which includes rural and urban communities. And that's why it's important to properly frame this issue before us as well. We do often think singularly of the digital divide as a rural issue, but the Census Bureau shows that nearly three times as many households in urban areas remain unconnected as in rural areas. And so in urban areas in particular, cost is frequently the issue. Research shows that there are folks who just think 
nearly 18 million, um, that broadband is simply too expensive. And to meet the needs of low-income people, some broadband providers already offer a low cost here. We must do more for these low-income families who are already bearing too many burdens of this health crisis and its ep economic fallout. I'm thankful for the work of Angela Seifer, who is here today representing NDIA, which has advocated for removing barriers to participation within these discount internet programs. In times of emergency, no American should go without a connection because of cost. And finally, you've heard me mention that our government can't work in silos. I don't think that those of us in this space should work in silos either. And so it's going to take the cooperation of government, of industry, public and private, as we work together to serve our low income households and Americans that are vulnerable in this crisis. Those Americans should not be left behind today. I do look forward to hearing from all of our panelists, and that includes Congresswoman Slotkin and Lieutenant Governor of Michigan Gilchrist, who are prioritizing digital equity in the midst of addressing a variety of needs during this pandemic. Thank you to our panelists for joining us and our moderator here today. I'm thrilled to turn over uh, the uh, voice of this panel to our moderator, Mike Muse, an industrial engineer turned media entrepreneur who serves as the host of Sirius XM's The Mike Muse Show. And he is, uh, as I'm sure you all know, deeply interested in politics and pop culture. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sparks, it is so great to be on this call with you. I salute you for all the work that you have done. I am a little bit of a policy geek. You probably couldn't tell by this pop collar that I have, um, but I've always wanted to be in conversation with you. You are was someone who was always on my get um, to interview, so it is an honor and a pleasure that I had this chance to be on this call with you. Thank you for the advocacy and for fighting the fight as it is not easy. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this call. I have a personal connection to this call. I am from the state of Michigan. I am born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. I hashtag all my Instagram posts, pure Michigan for the most part. And of course, the most important thing that I hashtag is go blue. Uh, as a University of Michigan graduate, uh, Michigan represents so much to me. Um, although I do live in New York City, it's interesting. As I was younger, I wanted to run away from Michigan as quick as I could because it wasn't exciting enough for me. It wasn't enough light. Um, but now having all the lights I've had for these number of years, I'm actually ready to come back home. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation because in order for me to come back home, I have to make sure I have the technology that I need in order to do my job so that I don't become part of the unemployment numbers commissioner that you were just mentioning. And so it's important that we do have this broadband and technology because media entertainment is technology. It is the foundation of what we're doing. We wouldn't be able to have this interview that we're having right now if it wasn't for technology. And so this is why it's important to have this conversation. And so someone who I'm going to bring into the conversation now who is going to ensure the protection uh, to make sure I have a place to come back home to and that technology is there is Congresswoman Brendan Lawrence. Brenda Lawrence is someone who I followed her race. Uh, interesting enough, she was running against a personal friend of mine uh, who shall not be named, but I loved him dearly. Uh, it was a very competitive race uh, between the two of them. And I was always watching her. And if my boy was going to lose to somebody, I'm glad that he lost to Brenda Lawrence because she is a tireless advocate. Uh, Congresswoman, I have seen you fight. Uh, I have seen you in the trenches. I have seen what you've done on behalf of your community, and particularly the bougie side of Detroit, which is Southfield. Uh, that's a little inside joke that we have there going on. And I'm curious if you go to Southfield, Lathrop, or High, because I think Lieutenant Garland Gilchrist will be able to add some color to the difference between those two institutions. So without further ado, enough of me, more of the dynamic Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Welcome to this conversation, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, we'll have our arms open welcoming you home. I want to say good afternoon to everyone. And I want to thank all of the listeners for joining us today and the FCC Commissioner Starks. Thank you so much for today because this discussion is very important and timely. The digital divide. I remember when I first heard that and asked someone, tell me what you mean when you say that. And at that time, um, many of you know, I served in, uh, on a school board locally. And so we're talking about innovation, how we are educating children, how parents are supporting the education of their children at home. Ladies and gentlemen, this issue of a digital divide 
is something that this virus have just pulled the scab off. It's an ugly sore in our country. I'm glad that we have a panelist today that are experts that can shed some light on it. My amazing colleague, um, Alyssa Slotkin, she's a freshman, but you would never know it. She is just a brilliant advocate and tireless fighter for our country. Uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Gilchrist, a young man that gives me hope for the future of this country. Uh, he's just amazing on so many levels. Um, I thank him for his leadership every day during this virus. Um, Ms. Uh, Fazlusa, who is from Common Sense Media, thank you so much for being here. Joshua Edmonds from the city of Detroit and Angela Cipher from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I wanna thank them all for joining us today. So let's talk about this digital divide. In America, there's a category of people who we call the working poor. They go to work every day. They're not sitting around with their hand out for anyone to give them anything. But because of the salaries and other issues, some, especially if it's a woman, single head of household, may work two jobs, one job just to pay for childcare and the other to put food and on the table and shelter and clothes for their children. So by the time they pay their bills, luxuries, and unfortunately access to media, uh, to the internet, to the broadband has in some families become a luxury. It's just not attainable. And so when I heard the interesting comment that everybody goes home to be safe, we're gonna telework, everyone work from home. For some people that was not an option. And it became glaringly aware when we said our children will stay at home and we're gonna have online learning. Well, for some children, that is not a, a reality. And we're confronted with that ugly, ugly reality of dividing our country up. And the digital divide is one of those that put people in pockets of disparity, this pockets of, of lack of access that adds to the, the divide of wealth in this country. I was so proud to lead a letter to that Commissioner Stark uh, referenced with the Senator Stabenow and Peters and the entire Michigan delegation. And it was one from our senators as well to prioritize and provide funding for essential broadband program in this next relief program. And I'm proud to say we're having ongoing discussions every day. Um, and broadband continues to be one of those high priorities. Now I can tell you oftentimes when we talk about the digital divide or lack of broadband, it's usually referencing the rural America. But now we have, and we have this opportunity with this broadcast with the collective mind to awaken America to the digital divide right in urban America. And our children who live in poverty are those who do not have access are being left behind. Michiganders here in Michigan, we, we know what it means to fight back and to find resources. So being a former mayor, one of the things that really made me stop and think is when they said, okay, children go home and learn online. I fought hard to have a library that had amazing computer, computer labs so if a child didn't have it at home, they could go to the library. We shut down all the libraries. So these children were literally with no resources. So I look forward to all the questions and the interactions. And before I leave the screen, I just wanna to say to everyone, I am praying for your families, your safety and for your well being. For those who have survived this virus, I know the stress that has gone through that um we must get through this together and i'm committed to doing that thank you and i i will uh give it back to our moderator mike 
Thank you so much, Congresswoman Lawrence. I appreciate your remarks. You have made Delta Sigma Theta very proud. Uh, as a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, I salute you, my friend. <laughs> and grieve. Um, <laughs> yo, yo. With that being said, I want to now turn our attention to Representative Alyssa Slotkin. Uh, Representative Slotkin, you are my congressperson um, in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, my mother often talks about you uh, pretty often and frequently. Um, and so I'm paying attention to what is happening in my home city. I really do love home. Um, and to what the Congresswoman Lawrence was talking about, she really mentioned a couple of things. She mentioned work uh, and she mentioned school and she mentioned rural. What people don't realize, let me be more personal. What I didn't realize is how rural the state of Michigan really is until I left the state of Michigan and I came back. Growing up, I literally thought Michigan was Lansing, Saginaw, Flint, and Detroit, <laughs> and maybe Muskegon, for, <laughs> but that about it, though. I didn't think anything else. And then going back and exploring more, we went to Mackinac Island, we went to Traverse City, but you're just staying on the highway, right? You're just passing through. That's only part when you go up to Upper Peninsula. Michigan is rural. It really, really is rural. And Congresswoman Slotkin, you represent a really interesting district where it is rural and it's city. Uh, but it's also blue collar as it is white collar. And so that is affected, the digital divide affects all those entities very differently. How are you looking at it like a state of the district, if you will, of trying to uh, weave that needle through rural, city, union, blue collar, and white collar in the needs of that district? Yeah, thanks for having me, first, of all, first and foremost, uh, to the commissioner, to my fellow congresswoman. Um, uh, it's great to be uh, allowed to participate. We do have one of those interesting districts. Michigan's eighth district is mid-Michigan, you know, Rochester Hills through Lansing, urban, suburban, and rural. Um, and, you know, as Congresswoman Lawrence alluded to, the COVID-19 crisis is basically taking every inequality that we already had existing in our society and pulling at the seams and putting a spotlight on it. Um, and that is, uh, completely obvious when it comes to the area of broadband. Um, I represent some really rural areas. I'm, I'm tuning in here from my farm in Holly, Michigan, and just down the road, um, we have Heartland, Michigan, where over 20% of the students have no access to the internet. Um, the teachers are literally Xerox copying um, worksheets and dropping them off in the mailboxes of the students just to keep their minds active and keep them doing something. Um, but then on the other side of the district in Lansing, you have access issues as well. And I think the thing um, that has really been driven home for me is that we have to start thinking of internet access as a public utility. It's like having access to electricity or water or telephone service. It's something that's becoming standard and required to function in modern day America. Um, and so there's a bunch of us, um, Congresswoman Lawrence being one of them who has been at the forefront of pushing this concept. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we're just trying to, to work and parse through the problems we have in our district. And I really break it down in three ways. Um, we have a problem of access, right? We have folks in our district who are just live in such a rural area that there's no signal that they can get. There's no uh, fiber optic way that they can get uh, uh, internet access. Then you have the issue that I think is coming down the pike, which is bandwidth. We've got a lot of kids who are on uh, the internet and they're doing their few hours a day. But what if we needed to continue doing this at a rigorous level with testing and sort of more formal? I don't think a lot of kids would have the bandwidth to be able to do that, especially multiple kids in the home, to be able to keep up with the needs from school. Um, if we needed to do more online, we're already struggling with that. And then devices, right? If you, it's one thing to have the internet, it's another thing to have the device that lets you interact um, with school or with work. And we know that our school districts are struggling to get the devices to the kids who need them most. So um, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's an issue that really binds together urban communities, suburban communities, and rural communities. Um, and I think it's uh, an area where, you know, Sometimes in a moment of real crisis, we can find real opportunities. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone on how we turn this into a moment where we have kind of a realization that broadband is something that's a public utility for everybody. 
Thank you, Representative Slotkin, uh, for those words. I just want to turn the attention now over uh, to someone who's a frequent guest of the Mike Mew Show, which is the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Michigan, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. Uh, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, I have particular interest with you around this conversation because of your background in technology. Uh, I don't think enough people really understand how your background is computer engineering and computer science. And so we talk about digital divide and digital technology. This is your wheelhouse uh, that Congresswoman Slotkin just mentioned about schooling. My issue that I'm thinking about during COVID-19 is K through 12, right? And those individuals who are in rural and in city who may not have access to that ability to do the worksheets that the Congresswoman was talking about. They may not have the ability to tune in and to be present uh, in class. How are you looking at it from a state perspective from the K through 12 digital divide narrative? Mike. Mike, thank you. And I want to thank the, the commissioner for hosting us. I want to thank uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Slotkin and Congresswoman Lawrence, who is my congresswoman, uh, really proud to be here with you and the rest of our panelists. When, when talking about this challenge of internet access and how it relates to education, um, this has been something that's been present in our communities for far too long. And, and I'm certainly one in our administration has been advocating to increase access to the internet across the state of Michigan because it is critical for education, for health, for economic opportunity, and just enabling people's imaginations to think about how they can take part and help shape the future. I want to put some numbers around what Congresswoman Slotkin just shared around these challenges around both children not having internet enabled devices in their homes, as well as not having sufficient internet access or internet access at all. So we, um, in the beginning of this COVID-19 crisis, as we were weighing the decision of whether to end face-to-face -face K-12 education, one of the considerations was an understanding of our internet access gap and how we could fill that. And so our estimates working with school districts across the state is that there are about uh, 600,000 children in the state of Michigan who do not have access to an internet enabled device in their home, 600,000. And the number of kids who don't have sufficient internet access in their house, so as Congresswoman alluded to, being able to, to stream more than one video at one time or even have access to the internet, it's about 60,000 kids across the state. Those are pretty staggering numbers. And so what we're working to do at the state level, both in the context of the pandemic, but also to lay the foundation for continued collective connectivity is we have simply, um, we've issued challenges. We've issued challenges to the, the providers in the state of Michigan to say that, you know, this is part of the unprecedented time, the unprecedented response that we need is for everyone to step up and play their part. You've seen providers do things like eliminate data caps and those kinds of things. We need them to step up and do even more. And so we've, I, I have been personally working with, as part of our COVID-19 response, device manufacturers, internet service providers of all stripes across the state of Michigan to work to make these things available to these children, these households first. But also, I think the things that we'll learn in the context of the pandemic will help us deal with those broader challenges, the challenge of access and build out. So literally, the internet will be built to serve more people from an infrastructure perspective. The challenge of affordability, where we're rethinking what it truly means for the internet to be affordable. Um, so while we have programs like Internet Essentials and AT&T and AT Access, how can we go further and innovate on, from a business model perspective about how we can deliver the service? And then the third piece that I want to touch on is digital literacy. The fact that when someone has access to the asset of Internet access, when someone is able to afford it in their family budget, then how do we ensure that people are empowered with the tools and the skills and the, and the resources and sensibilities to be able to take full advantage of everything that internet access has to offer? Entertainment, education, economic opportunity, um, health healthcare outcomes, all of the above. And the last thing I'll say before, before passing it back, Mike, is this also has an impact on our public health. We have done things in Michigan to, to greatly expand uh, telemedicine and its availability. And the last conversation I had with the FCC was back in 2015 here in the city of Detroit talking about connecting the health. And so making sure that people have sufficient internet access to manage their health, not just their symptoms in the context of coronavirus and COVID-19, but manage preventative health plans through having a relationship with their doctor that can work both in person and through telemedicine. By making physicians services more available to people who are able to be connected in positions to be able to serve more people and to make sure that Medicaid can cover that. These are the policy and infrastructure things that we're trying to work on at the state level. And hopefully we can create some models here that will be re replicable across the country.
Hello, can you guys hear me now? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, you can, okay, great. Um, sorry about that, I'm having some technical difficulties. The irony I'm having technical difficulties as we're talking about broadband and technology and access to it. Uh, but Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, I did hear everything that you said, uh, particularly when you talked about the challenges and issuing challenges. Uh, which brings me to Joshua Edmonds. Uh, Joshua Edmonds is from the city of Detroit, uh, really focused on digital inclusion. Um, and this has a sweet spot for me because of the K through 12 and because of the numbers that we are understanding uh, who will be most direly impacted by not having access to broadband digital access. A large number comes from that share as Garland Gilchrist was just talking about numbers and data. Uh, so Joshua, can you talk to us a little bit more how the city of Detroit is not only thinking through this, but currently dealing with this crisis of COVID-19 when it comes to K-12 education, recognizing that all the students may not even have access to broadband technology and or may not even have access to the products that are actually needed? Sure. So uh, I want to thank everybody. Thank Commissioner Starks, uh, Con Congresswoman Lawrence, obviously, uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still foregoing his haircuts, but I, I definitely am. Um, and, and as always, it's, it's great to um, see Angela Seifer. She's been an incredible uh, asset, as well as the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, what has, that has directly informed our work on the ground in Detroit. I'll say, you know, I also want to give a huge shout out to, to, to Mayor Duggan and my Chief Information Officer, Beth Niblock, who had the foresight to prioritize digital equity, you know, prior to COVID in a significant way by way of appointing me to actually do this work. So th this was my day in and day out. And I you know, want to say that that is advantageous to us because we can essentially showcase to other communities that are going through COVID right now that, yes, a COVID response for digital equity is great, but it's also great to do this because it's the right thing to do. And that's where we were. And so um, you know, all of last year was us uh, building relationships with funders and, uh, and, and an indiscriminate amount of actors to really say, if we are going to sustainably reduce this digital divide, knowing that we need to take a long-term focus to this because the digital divide is uh, exacerbated by the cycle of poverty and because we have um, very little uh, uh, federal alignment on the topic specifically because we're in urban America, um, you know, we've had to really take on a, a role of one being a, a fundraiser. Uh, Commissioner Starks had mentioned that we've uh, been uh, having conversations about exhausting our local resources. On the topic of K through 12, um, you know, it's made national news that thanks to the leadership from a, a number of funders, including uh, General Motors, Quicken Loans, uh, DTE, uh, you know, we were able to raise $23 million uh, to ensure that every single public school student gets a device, uh, six months of LTE data, tech support, and an agreement to sign them up for internet essentials on the back end. And while yes, we have, um, you know, two, two low cost internet providers in the city and low cost for saying that's less than $10 a month, um, you know, only one of them meets the federal threshold for broadband. And so everything that we're doing has been very, very strategic because we understand that if we're not going to do this in a long-term basis, we're only going to do this on a project term, project basis, uh, or only act as if the digital divide is a uh, COVID response, then what we essentially do, um, you know, we make an investment and then a year from now, where are we? And so, you know, us building the model that we're building, we are prioritizing sustainability, we're prioritizing impact, we are shifting to more of a uh, data-driven model where we can actually even use that to uh, guide investments in this space. Uh, I'll tell people whenever we say digital equity, that actually means something. Equity is not a buzzword. Equity is us saying that it, it's going to be a commitment for the least of us, that yes, citywide broadband might be sexy, but neighborhood broad, neighborhood wi uh, citywide Wi-Fi might be sexy, but um, neighborhood Wi-Fi, where we actually know these neighborhoods are, are underconnected, that's what equity is. And so we are prioritizing digital equity, we're prioritizing sustainability, and um, you know, we're thankful for the opportunity to get a semblance of alignment uh, by way of this call, but moving forward, we are seeking that alignment with the federal government, with the state, um, in, a, in a way that we know that there's a chain of command and a chain of action uh, to support digital equity in Detroit. I'll end by saying um, that given that the sheer uh, inequity in Michigan and in Detroit as it relates to digital inequity, us solving uh, the our bridging the digital bridging the digital divide in a sustainable fashion locally on the ground here is great for America. 
Uh, Michigan is a microcosmic representation of the U.S. Detroit represents the plight of a lot of urban cities. And if we are effectively able to bridge it here locally, that is a replicable model that we can take and that is actually rooted in some, in some success and actual partnerships that are meant to last. Julian, again, the city of Detroit, uh, and particularly when it comes to the public-private partnerships um, that you guys are partnering, especially with Quicken Loans, um, they are very instrumental in the city of Detroit and being a great um, business partner within the city and also to ultimately within the state. Uh, so let's just keep the, the trend going and talking about the youth. Now I want to bring in Amina Fazula. Uh, Amina, you are a wonderful policy advocate uh, working with Common Sense Media. I've been talking a lot about how COVID-19 has really showcased a lot of the, the inequality that has been, always existed within America. Um, and it doesn't show itself more than ever than how K-12 is like it's being advocated for. Uh, you guys do focus a lot on the work within children. So for me, I have a two-part question for you. How are you guys addressing and advocating with policies as people on, in Congress are creating different stimulus packages and thinking about ways to be a solution uh, for the problem that we're experiencing? So how are you guys advocating for the youth during this time period? But then also, too, if you could give us a little bit of insight into your boardrooms in terms of how are you thinking about shifting your policy advocacy post COVID-19 after seeing all the inequities that has been revealed that wasn't so blaring, glaring at first? Hi there, this is Amina, can you hear me? Great, um, I can't hear your audio now, so I'm just gonna talk assuming everybody can hear me. All right. Um, so that's a great question. Um, there, you know, let me start with a few numbers first. You know, there, there are, these are old numbers, an estimated 12 million students left offline. And, um, and we have been advocating for connectivity for students um, at home uh, around the homework gap for years. Um, but now in light of COVID-19, um, our understanding of what the homework gap is is completely different. Um, so that has been, I think, a new hurdle to explain to policymakers um, that it's more than just one device in the household in some amount of connectivity, but rather we need to have really robust connectivity so that every student in the household can access distance learning simultaneously and that every student in the household has a device that they can actually do schoolwork on. Um, and, and, and it grows beyond that. Um, teachers, uh, we're hearing from teachers. We put out a survey to our Connect All Students campaign and we heard from over uh, 200 teachers from uh, about uh, 200 teachers from 39 states um, telling us uh, that they're having difficulties themselves connecting as well as their own students. Um, so this is a new um, issue uh, for, for Congress to grapple with, understanding the level of um, support that schools need exists well beyond the four walls of the school itself, that teachers need to be supported within their homes with adequate access to broadband, um, and also with um, adequate access to um, uh, uh, devices as well. Thank you so much, Amina, for your conversation and for the words that you have brought into this space. Um, audience, up to this point, I've been focusing on the K through 12, uh, particular within Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. Uh, Joshua Edmonds and the work the city of Detroit is doing, and we just heard from Amina with the work that Common Sense Media is really doing and advocating for that. Now I want to bring in a special guest, Angela Sieber from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, to really talk about, uh, if you will, Angela, I started mentioning how COVID-19 has exposed so much inequities within our system for all the reasons, particularly K through 12. But as we expand and we go beyond K through 12 to the adult population, if you will, I wanna talk about low income residents of the United States of America, and particularly within the state of Michigan too as well, and how has COVID-19 exposed the inequities of the digital divide that's impacted them? 
right? It's impacted individuals being able to participate, you know, into the job, the job force and the work economy uh, with the inability to possibly see what jobs are available. Even we think about the gig economy, right? Access to digital divide and broadband access to really sign up for services like Instacart or other gig economy um, entities that provide that type of service. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're seeing the inequities being exposed due to COVID-19 and what is most on your mind as eventually we will come out of this whenever that is, but what is on your mind next on the slate for advocacy, recognizing all the divisions that we see now? Sure, Mike. Hi, everyone. Big thanks to all my Michigan friends for inviting me. I think maybe there was a realization that I'm born and bred from Ohio and you all still let me participate. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad I did that. <laughs> I didn't let the rivalry get in the way. And so this long as you didn't go to Ohio State. No, 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 University of Toledo for me. That means you're smart. We like you, keep going. <laughs> okay, super, I'm not gonna get kicked off the, the webinar. <laughs> so I think, Mike, that's a great question. Uh, what we know is that the lower households income, the less likely they are to have broadband in the home. And if we look at the U.S. Census data, even if we take into account mobile, 18 million U.S. households do not have any kind of internet, even mobile. 14 million of those 18 million are urban. So this tells us that it is, that it is a, uh, not only an availability issue, that there's much more beyond that. And I love that we are in this conversation addressing all of the barriers. We are addressing the availability of the internet. We are addressing the uh, cost of the internet, right? The affordability of it, but then also the digital skills, because if you don't have all of those things and the device, right? You have some of those, not all of them. How far is that going to get you? So the lower your income, the less likely you are to have broadband in the home, less likely you are to be using it. Uh, and in today's world, Gosh, like it was hard before. We would always talk about how important, right? It's my work, my work is important. But now the difference is I think it's life and death. I didn't, th I didn't think of it like that before, but now I do think of it like that. If folks can't stay in their homes and stay safe, they ha are forced to go out to order groceries, right? As you were saying, the gig economy, to participate all the things that those of us who do have access totally make use of in order to stay safe, and then in order also, we know that staying safe ourselves is part of our community staying safe. So we need to be looking at it as how this crisis has helped us draw attention to the issue, but then we can't let it go, right? What's that saying about, you know, not letting a good crisis go to waste? We have drawn new attention to this right now. And, and as has already been mentioned, and Josh is totally on the right track with this, let's, let's keep rolling with it because if we can, can really solve it, wouldn't that be incredible? I love how Angela left us on that, that note of, if we can solve it, wouldn't it be incredible, right? And I still, Angela, I'm the kind of guy who believes that the glass is always half full. And I have to admit, COVID-19 has made me recognize, I'm like, ooh, is it kind of half empty? I think it might be a little bit on the half empty side. And I think that's okay to have that dose of reality, right? Because when you have that dose of reality, you can solve for things a little bit more, but you do need to have that uptick of hope to recognize that it isn't just a rhetorical question, that this actually could be something we can solve for. And we do have all the entities, literally just on this call alone, who could help us solve these inequalities that exist. So with that being said, I just wanna bring back Commissioner Sparks. I wanna bring back Representative Lawrence, just to kind of hear your initial reaction to what our panelists has to say, and particularly with you, uh, Commissioner Sparks, you know, we heard uh, Representative Slotkins talk about the rural communities and the different dynamics that she has to address just within her state and within her district that represents all those different dynamics and variables. We've heard from Lieutenant Garland Gilcrest, who really began to focus and take us specifically on the K through 12 dynamic that we see. And then Joshua came through within the city of Detroit and then Amina with our kids and with Angela really talking about the gig economy. And so we had this whole reflectiveness going on. What is your reaction in particular to what Angela said of, can we solve for these things or is it too far gone? Yes, um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, obviously all of this is, um, you know, this is exactly why we've convened such a distinguished panel here. Um, you, you know, obviously taking some threads 
you know, rural rural America, we do find the, the issue there uh, most pointedly is access. Uh, and in particular, in the last year, although I had some issues with the way that it was specifically done, and this gets into broadband mapping issues, um, we had a $20 billion uh, rural digital opportunity fund uh, uh, that the FCC is going to have for 10 years to basically lay uh, connectivity out to um, uh, our rural areas. The hard part there is that to actually get connectivity out to rural areas, it is going to take kind of a number of years. It's not, uh, you're not able to um, uh, quickly uh, roll truck uh, and get connectivity out there. You really do need to have an incentive, a subsidy program in order to uh, get connectivity out there. And I am glad that we are um, uh, rolling out rural connectivity to uh, Americans there. In urban areas, though, as I pointed out, uh, most pointedly, there's Pew Research data that shows that 18 million Americans uh, do not uh, sign up for the internet, are disconnected uh, because it's simply too expensive. Um, and we know now, in particular, obviously, with the, 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 the swell of Americans that are finding themselves jobless now, I think that's why I have critically, and a lot of us that are in this policy space and hearing certainly of course here today, have really started to drill down on how do we make sure that there are affordable options uh, for our students. When you're talking about these K through 12 students, uh, in particular, my mind goes to these Title I households. For a lot of uh, students, um, you know, we know that their most consistent meal uh, comes from a Head Start breakfast and a free lunch. Uh, and a lot of schools uh, are staying open in order to deliver those lunches. Um, uh, and so we know that those are also the most disconnected homes at home uh, in terms of households. And so how do we focus on some of these that are the most low income, the most vulnerable, and have students that are going to need to learn and grow? Uh, and so um, obviously the idea of hotspots uh, has come about. And I'm all for hotspots. I mentioned it at the top of my opening remarks. but. Uh, you know, I'm working with industry where, you know, there's not a great sense of how many hotspots there are in America and how effective it is. Somewhere between 500 and 600,000 hotspots is what I've heard. And so that will do some good work. Um, and, and, and also the ability of, of certain devices to become hotspots. But really, we're going to need to get affordable connectivity into more homes. And that does come to the issue of uh, making sure that we connect all Americans. Commissioner Starks, I was so excited to turn to you. I called you Sparks. Uh, <laughs> I, I apologize for that, but you are sparking this conversation if I can save myself. Conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, the takeaways that I got, um, there was a point that was brought up can you imagine being a graduate of high school and or college and it's now time for you to seek a job? The reality of mailing in resumes doesn't exist anymore. Uh, can you imagine the barriers to getting employment if you do not have broadband or access to internet? Again, pushing a segment of our population to a a different side of less opportunity. Um, telemedicine is going to become critical for healthcare in America. Mental health, which we must take the issue of mental health to a higher level. When we get out of this crisis and try to bring some normalcy back to our lives, People who have not been able to grieve, the people who have died, the people who are children who are asking questions, why can't I go play with my friend? Why can't I go outside? What do you mean we have to stay safe? Uh, so I'm going to go back outside, am I safe? Um, mental health is going to become a great issue, and I know that we have implemented it with the veterans. Um, but you have to have a computer at home so that you can uh, participate. Ordering grocery, I was told by a number of my friends who are in my age bracket, don't even take the risk. Order your grocery and have them delivered. 
well, I'm sitting at home with a computer. I can do that. Um, the infrastructure. You have heard us in Congress have this, this continuous fight on investing in infrastructure. And everybody thinks about roads. They think about potholes and bridges. But infrastructure is also our broadband. Where are we with in, infusing infrastructure for our broadband into our budgets and into our planning. The electric car is kind of putting some energy around that because in order for us to have the smart cars or the um, the uh, electric cars and other thing, we have to infuse into our um, into infrastructure when we're doing roads to make sure that the road can talk to the car, the car can talk to um, uh, all the other infrastructure needs that comes in for navigation and other things. But the investment in infrastructure is something we need to keep our eye on. And Commissioner Starks, I really want you to lend your voice to when we again have another fight in this appropriation season. I sit on transportation and infrastructure that we have to fight for an inclusive um, infrastructure budget. And lastly, the affordability piece. Uh, we have an issue in Detroit with water, and I tell people we need clean water, we need safe water, and we need affordable water. Not only in Detroit, but around this country, affordability of a basic human need is a real issue right now. Just to give some more numbers, the state of Michigan has over 360,000 households, and that, that equates to one out of every four child in Michigan does not have access. And in addition to that, Detroit has nearly 40% of its population has no internet connection at all. So with that, I, I, I lend back to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Lawrence. You said something really interesting about infrastructure. And I think that it's important that we begin to rebrand the term of infrastructure, right? And I believe that if we rebrand the narrative infrastructure, because that is what we think about, I believe you can get the American public more on board when it comes to that. Because if I'm someone sitting who's unemployed, you talk about infrastructure, I may not think I have the skill sets to work on a highway system. I may not think that I have the skill sets to work on a bridge, right? So, and therefore, I don't feel any hopefulness of something can be done. As we move forward, I'm gonna ask a, a, a host point of privilege, if you will. Uh, Dr. Alyssa, if you can leave me unmuted as I go through this next round, so I can help manage the time that we have that, that is available. Uh, panel I want to kind of just give like a one minute assessment. I'm going to talk, I'm going to bump you off your talking points for a second. And I'm going to switch things up uh, because what Angela Seifer and Joshua Edmonds, you guys have stirred something in me. Uh, Joshua, we were talking about public private partnerships and Angela, you were talking about being solution oriented. And I beg the question that this doesn't have to be rhetorical. Uh, and we had a lot of statements from all of you, which was very fantastic. A lot of it seems like a lot to move the mountain on almost. Most, right. And I have this thing that I believe that politicians always or I should say Congress in D.C. often has a time of talking to themselves. Right. Congress in D.C. has a thing of not really the question is to ask for people to participate, but actually not doing the tangible things that are needed for people to participate. And so now I want to move in. I'm actually one by one. Please leave your responses just to admit it. Um, so that we can move forward with this, so we can conclude at a decent amount of time here uh, with Dr. Lisa, please keep me unmuted. Uh, U.S. Representative Slotkin, I want to ask you specifically, uh, as a member of Congress, in a dream scenario, who would you want to partner with in a public-private partnership to address the inequities of this, right? Yes, you have your colleagues in Congress. Yes, you have your colleagues on the Hill. But who would you want to partner with outside of D.C. that can help move this inequities of digital divide that we're talking about here today? Well, I mean, listen, the, you've got the, the standard companies who produce this, and we've seen some of them make offers and, and uh, during COVID-19 to try and bring down some of the prices. But I, I think, uh, again, frankly, I would look to history. There was a moment in time when we didn't have telephone service and electric service and water. And we made a, a decision as a country that you had access to that. As an American, you should have access to those things. So we don't have to make this up from whole cloth. We have actually a model 
for how to do this. And I actually think, um, and while I'm right there with you, that Congress also often talks to itself, um, we know that we will be doing some sort of stimulus program, and it will almost certainly involve infrastructure. So what if we actually took the moment and said, you know what, we always talk about starting with the shovel ready projects, start with the broadband, like just make a commitment that at the top of the list, you're going to have this moment of opportunity when we all kind of come to something on broadband and we're going to put it at the top of the list. And for every other shovel ready project, if you're going to be digging up a road, if you're going to be putting in new bridges, what are you doing on broadband and prove it before you get approval for that funding? So I do think that while we have been known to talk to ourselves, we do have a moment of opportunity in the next three months to actually prioritize these things and do some of the things that some of the panelists are talking about. Lieutenant Governor, from a public-private partnership with the state of Michigan, what entities or individuals, you don't have to call them out by name, would you want to see being brought up to work together in the state capitol in Lansing with you uh, to help solve for these, uh, these inequities? Because we know the state legislature alone uh, cannot solve for this. I think that, well, first of all, I echo the, what the Congresswoman just said in terms of the, how we should use this as an opportunity to build this infrastructure. We certainly we're thinking about this in terms of state level infrastructure. But I'd like to see more engagement from the uh, advocacy community and philanthropy as well on this. How can we look at finding what the, the business models of the future to deliver internet access in a sustainable way? And they're gonna be, need to be partners to pilot those projects. So we need to have a different type of investor on come to the table to partner with us. We need to have community organizations also think about how we can build the sort of lo highly localized capacities for what Josh was talking about in terms of neighborhood level services and how maybe those sorts of coalitions can come together and again, develop a different model for delivery, a different business model for making that sustainable. That's the innovation that I'm excited about. And I think there are lots of um, opportunities to explore that. I love how you said that. That is a solution that a lot of us can rally around. That's a solution a lot of us can help support you within that. I think about what some of the other state governors are doing around a lot of philanthropic endeavors that are existing. Um, and it may not be fair because a lot of like the billionaires kind of exist within the tri-state area, so we're assisting with that. But you don't have to be a billionaire to be able to get be a philanthropic endeavor. Which leads me right to you, Joshua. Lieutenant Governor mentioned philanthropy and from an investment from advocacy groups. When it comes to that, how would you give a, a counsel, if you will, to types like Lieutenant Governor uh, Gilchrist, individuals like myself, considered to be consider myself to be an advocate and a philanthropist? How would you govern us to make sure that you're getting the resources that you need? Because that is a management issue too, as well. And the city of Detroit, with all the public-private partnerships that you just mentioned earlier, talks a little bit about managing that ecosystem of philanthropy and advocacy. So uh, one, I'm thankful that you are an advocate. Uh, I will definitely keep that in mind <laughs> to, to the max. But uh, I'll say for us, managing that is us, is us doing a good job at the onset of managing expectations, saying your investment in this and X will yield this with total confidence. In order for us to get there, that is us building out a data infrastructure uh, to Commissioner Stark's point. He's been very, very outspoken on this. Our data on digital inclusion, specifically on broadband availability, is abysmal. We need a new way of collecting this information. And if we collect the information in the right way, I can empower my philanthropic community. I can even empower the federal government. If they are to move and finally invest in underserved communities the way that they need to, I can do it in a data-informed way. As it stands now, we're not doing that. And so we talk about moving the needle. We'll talk about a grandiose you know, $23 million, which is incredible. But at the same time, we are not data-driven and data-informed enough. I'll just say, if I go down my list of ask right now, uh, one, the, the, the state of Michigan, let's prioritize and get the state broadband office up and running. If the Digital Equity Act were to pass today, we would not be able to get funding from it because the state broadband office needs to be the um, intermediary to allocate the funds at the municipal level. Uh, the FCC, let's talk about um, really tackling this uh, asymmetrical broadband. Uh, 25 3, 25 prioritizes the providers. We need you to provide, uh, prioritize the consumers. Congress, we've made a lot of investments on this, uh, you know, in, in lieu of COVID, uh, 23 million again, in the city of Detroit. If you guys are talking about doing any investment around broadband, it would be really great if we started to talk about matching. So that way we didn't exhaust our local resources just for you guys to come in afterwards. And so this is, that's, that's kind of where I am solution my uh, oriented. I hope that's under a minute. Joshua, you did a fantastic job. And I love how you call people to task on that one. No holds barred with that. Present company included. And just how you handle that, like with no chill, 
I got you on record with everything you need. How you called out the FCC and Congress simultaneously while they're on the call. Brilliant. I see why you are there. You sh I, I really believe that you shouldn't take a job such as that if you're not willing to take a stance on behalf of your constituency. I salute you, my brother, for doing that and being solution-oriented and with a smile. So I want to go, you did it in a minute, I want to go to Amina. You, we're talking about advocacy, right? And so as an advocate, what do you need more, right, in order to help you empower from like a partnership, like a public-private partnership as an advocate, what do you need more? I mean, absolutely, we need to have good data, as Joshua mentioned. So data drives enthusiasm, both from policymakers, but from partners that we have. You know, we can develop partners in industry, we can develop partners on the ground, we can develop partners in philanthropy as well as with policymakers. So good data helps drive all those partnerships. Um, but right now, I think you know I I see an immediate need to cover you know the homework gap and also the the critical needs of all Americans to be able to access the internet so they can stay safe and they can stay home, as Angela mentioned. Um, but then we've got to look forward. You know, we will certainly have a recovery package. When that recovery package shows up, it's got to have infrastructure in it. That infrastructure has to go to every home. It's got to cover those urban underserved areas as well as rural underserved areas. And it's got to prioritize the best possible technology. These hard to reach communities. We learn through COVID-19 that people need adequate, robust access. And we also want to make sure that we use our precious government dollars effectively and efficiently. So prioritize the best possible future-proof technology for every single community, even the ones that are hard to reach. That's gonna take a serious investment from the federal government, as well as matching funds from state government. But that'll pay off in the long run because upgrading that type of infrastructure will be so much easier and so much cheaper in the long run. Thank you so much, Amina. Angela, I'm depending upon you. We have a short amount of time period, but I believe you can do it because you're an inspiration behind the, that second part of the question that I asked. From a solution-oriented perspective, from someone who can be a partner with you, Josh and Amina just doubled down on data. Uh, you were recognized as one of the tw 25 top doers in America when it comes to this type of stuff. What are you looking for in a partnership or what do you need that will make a dream partnership for you in order to address the solution of inequities? In one minute, if you can, I believe in you. Let me tell you the real work right now is occurring on the ground. If I could replicate Josh and put him in every city, <laughs> I would, right? Because that's where the real work is occurring. But what do all those Joshes out there need? They need help from the state. They need help from the feds, right? So we have to have, we're, we're seeing it more so than ever before from, from philanthropy, from corporations, but there's still a lack of understanding of how that real work gets done. And so we have to have more of these conversations. Give me a magic wand, please. Uh, more of these in every state. To have yeah. you all in this virtual room talking about this, I cannot say how awesome that is. And we've never had this kind of attention on the issue before. How far might we go if we keep doing this and figuring out how we can all help all those Joshes out there? I have high hopes. I agree with you on that one, Angela. Uh, with that being said, that wraps up my portion of this conversation. Uh, thank you, all the panelists that are there. I hope that the, even the panelists would go back and watch this video and hear the thread that I'm seeing forming that could be a solution. Each one of you have said something really unique. I don't have time to discuss the thread, but there is a thread and a pattern that is showing up. I think Angela's seeing it too as well. I hope you do as well. Thank you so much for your time. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, who will close this out, followed by Commissioner Starks with some closing remarks. I want to say thank you to everyone. You all are amazing. Josh, I just joined your fan club. Um, I want everyone here to know that um, this is a real issue. It, it affects so many people as we talked about it. And if we truly want an amazing, prepared workforce in America, we're going to have to commit to broadband access. And this is not a giveaway. This is part of building a strong economy, an educated economy. Um, 
And as we look at technology reducing costs in so many areas, we can't do that without the broadband. Thank you all so much. And Commissioner Starks, thank you so much for having me here. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Slotkin as well. Um, and of course, to all the advocates, uh, you know, I could not agree more. I agree that there's, you know, such a, a consistent thread. Um, and, and I know from my position, obviously, at the federal level, I'm always happy uh, to hear from folks, even if the pointed barbs are at, uh, at me. So uh, I know what an advocate Josh is, and when you get him on, uh, on camera, you, you never know. But actually, the points that he was focusing on, he and I see eye to eye on, uh, and I'd stand shoulder to shoulder with him. And Amina had the same thread. We need to future-proof these connections. I don't think 25.3 is enough. I've stated that for quite a long time. Uh, and and uh, you know the fact that uh, the FCC of all uh, should know uh, with better accuracy who has and who has not in terms of broadband. It's shameful that we don't. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, one of the things that I just dissented from was what I um, colloquially call our State of the Union report, which is our Section uh, 706 report. Uh, where the majority said that we're doing a pretty good job, and I just don't think that's correct. If anything, I think that this COVID-19 has shown uh, the inequity uh, that surrounds digital divide um, uh, and, and how much it is really holding back Americans and leaving folks further and further behind. A couple other um, things. I would obviously foot stomp um, the local initiatives. Uh, I think that is going to be a tremendous place where a lot of ground is going to be made up. I know uh, like many of you, I've read Rahm Emanuel's book talking about how the very local level, including mayors, are doing uh, some of the most uh, heavy and intensive work on picking up the burdens on, on how to uh, drive and move our society forward. Um, two things that we haven't talked about today uh, that I did want to kind of leave um, some thoughts on. The first is, obviously, all of this is going to be, connectivity is powering our economy in a lot of ways. It is uh, helping us with telemedicine. I agree with all of those comments that I know uh, the Lieutenant Governor was talking about as well, and I know Congresswoman Lawrence was as well. Um, but what is going to happen when the uh, economy does open back up, when COVID-19 um, 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 is finally doesn't have such a stronghold on us all self-quarantining and staying home? The fact of the matter is that folks are going to need to look for jobs uh, and that's going to happen online. You're not going to have people actually physically going to a lot of locations in order to try to get back into the economy. And so for the 30 plus million Americans who um, uh, are unemployed now just as a result of COVID-19, we need to make sure that those are the folks who are connected because when our economy opens back up, we're gonna need to make sure they're connected so that we can get them into jobs. The last thing that I would highlight here really quickly, and I know um, it's, it, it, I, I don't want to carve this up in particular in terms of another demographic, uh, but something that has been weighing on me, obviously, uh, are seniors. Uh, and I know we didn't talk about them a lot here today. Uh, they are some of the most disconnected Americans as well. It does get into the point that we talked about uh, with digital literacy. Uh, you know, I've pers personally gone up to uh, a lot of public libraries, and, and you do see uh, some uh, some seniors who have gotten connected and they realize the power of it. But you do have a lot of folks as well. Uh, the fact that they are isolated, the fact that they are not able to connect with their friends, uh, with, with family in the same way, we really need to make a concerted effort. And this also gets to the mental health point uh, that somebody else talked about, making sure that some of our most isolated, including our seniors, are better connected. It is, uh, they are also a, a real constituency that is going to have to have some focus on here. Uh, and with that, thank you all for your thoughts, for your instructions, for your guidance, uh, for, your, uh, for your hard work and for your ad advocacy. Uh, please all, and including those that have joined us online here, be safe, be well, uh, and um, uh, please keep up the fight. Thank you.